Hey guys, I've been playing around with storage as a new home lab type project. It's been a lot of fun. Storage is decentralized cloud-based object or file storage. Uh, so the way it works is you upload your file, the file's encrypted of course, and then it's split into 80 different pieces which are then distributed to different storage nodes around the world. The technology is very cool and there is so much redundancy built in. Of those 80 pieces that are scattered around, the network only needs 29 pieces to reassemble your file when you're ready to download it. Additionally, the network is constantly monitoring for when nodes go offline to rebuild and repair those pieces to make sure there are always a sufficient number of pieces available uh, for when your file needs to be retrieved. Anyone can operate a storage node and that's what we're gonna take a look at here today. So here's the storage node I put together on my bench. I've been running it for about a week and a half or so now. Uh, and it runs great, but it's pulling a lot of power. It's running around 85 watts because of the choice of components here. Uh, so today's video is pretty much going to be rebuilding this, rebuilding a new storage node, and then hopefully migrating this existing data over with minimal downtime. So before we get to that, let's take a look at the statistics of the current storage node. So here's the current node I'm working with, and I started it on September 11th, I guess. Uh, it's currently the 21st, so it's been about a week and a half. I've used 1.17 terabytes of data so far, and I'm storing 910 gigabytes of data so far. And you can see on my uh, suspension and audit statistics here, uh, my lowest satellite is US-1, showing a 99.98% online time. Uh, unfortunately, this was on my bench as a test setup, and of course there was a power blip when I was at work, uh, so I suffered about two hours of downtime. Under their terms of service, you're only permitted to have five hours of downtime per month. Obviously, once this is in the server rack, that shouldn't be a problem because there is redundant power through an automatic transfer switch. Taking a look at statistics of the node, I've passed 2,365 audits so far and I have an upload acceptance rate of 99.7%. I am surprised this is so high because from what I've been reading online, anywhere from 94 to 95 is considered good, and I'm sitting at 99.7%. Your nodes with the lower latency, the faster bandwidth connections, are going to be the ones that win most at storing these pieces, and I just had fiber installed. I've got two gig symmetrical fiber, uh, and the, the ping time to US-1 is about 10 milliseconds, so I've got pretty good latency. Um, that I think is contributing to the 99.7% acceptance rate. So here we have a Supermicro X11 SSL-F motherboard. And I picked this motherboard up on eBay. It came with a Xeon E3 1220V5 CPU. That is a four core, four thread, 3.0 gigahertz base clock, 3.5 gigahertz turbo. The 1230 would have been a better choice. That would have given me a four core, eight thread CPU and more uh, speed. This is what it came with. It'll be fine for now. 32 gigs, DDR4, 2400 megahertz, ECC unbuffered memory, it's two 16 gig sticks. That ECC uh, UDIM memory is, is an interesting one to find. And then I've just got a cheap Samsung, 256 gig, it's a PM961 NVMe SSD. This does not have any uh, M2 slots, so I have it on a little riser card here. This is a Supermicro SC, I think it's an 815 uh, chassis. It's a 1U chassis, it's got dual redundant power supplies there. It fits standard ATX motherboard sizes. It's got four three and a half inch hard drive bays. And that is a SAS 815TQ backplane. It's certainly nothing special. So this should make for a very low power, high performance storage node, perfect. First, I need to get rid of this fan and heat sink. I won't be needing it in this 1U case. I'm gonna put this slimmer heat sink on here. Clean this off just a little bit here. New thermal paste. And that heat sink does not fit. That is unfortunate. All right, so I've got a whole box of Supermicro heat sinks, but I've got none that fit that size. So this heat sink's back on. We're gonna put it together this way, and then I'll have to go and purchase a 1U style heat sink for this motherboard. We can go ahead and put our memory in. It will be in the black slots labeled DIM A1 and DIM B1. So this is A1, and this is B1. All right, going to remove this front thing here. It's got a serial port and two USB ports. There's not a lot of space in a 1U case, and I don't need all of this extra cabling. Supermicro has done a great job at being standard in terms of the size and placement of most of these components on most boards. So a lot of boards will actually use the same IO shield. And that's great news because the IO shield in this case lines up with the motherboard and I didn't have to purchase a new one. All right, I can plug in my motherboard power here. 
and there are two CPU connectors, one 8 pin and then one 4 plus 4 pin. Going to use the 4 plus 4 pin since it's longer. And then I've got this little uh, communications cable. I'm not really sure what it's for. I guess it's just for the motherboard to pull statistics from the power supply backplane maybe. There's no way that's gonna go back on, I don't think. I don't know how they fit this stuff in here sometimes. Connect the four SATA cables from the back plane. Uh, this is a chassis intrusion switch, don't really need it. And then we have our status LED and power button. The red line is going to be pin number one. That goes in the connector located right here. We've got this little 90 degree angle riser board here. This is part number RSC-RR1U-E16 and that will go in the X16 slot here. Now this is an X16 side slot, but it is only wired for X8 or eight lanes. And then we can take our NVMe riser and that should slide in fairly easily here. I've got a few case fans to put in here and I'll position those near the CPU and probably one here to cool that NVMe card. All right, so I've got power, IPMI, ethernet one, and here we go. All right, so I just finished loading the operating system. We are running uh, Oracle Linux 9.4, and it's pretty much just a clone of Red Hat. I'm using the unbreakable Linux kernel, UEK. So some other prerequisites, I have Firewall D disabled, I have SE Linux disabled, and I created a separate account for the storage software to run under. So I'm not gonna walk through an entire installation here. I'm gonna assume you know about this a little bit already. I'm gonna be copying over the software installation uh, and the startup script from the old server. And then we should be able to simply move over the hard drive, mount it on the new server and it should start. So the server on the left here, storage temp, is the temporary server. The one on the right is the new server. So I need to go to CD slash OPTs where I installed the software. We'll do an SCP-PR for recursive keep permissions. Uh, 30.20 colon slash opt slash storage node. And we'll put that in the current directory. So that's comprised of three files, the storage node, the storage node updater, and then the success rate.sh script, which I uh, obtained from the storage forums that somebody had written. So we need to change ownership of that chown-r storage 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 node. Uh, next, I need to copy over the startup script. So let's see, that's CD ETC system D system. All right, so hdd1.service I think is the one that I want. Yes, it is. SCP-PR hdd1.service. And system CTL daemon reload. Uh, FS tab, so we need to add the hard drive mount to it. So vim etc FS tab. So this is my hard drive here. You can see I have it under slash MNT slash HDD1. It's gonna copy that over and I'm gonna make one change to here. I'm gonna put comma no A time. Uh, so by default, anytime a file is accessed, Linux updates the last access time on that file. And it just causes a little bit of extra overhead that we can eliminate since we don't necessarily care about that. Um, so we're gonna mount this with the no A time flag. So I think we are ready to go ahead and move the hard drive over. So I'm gonna do a system CTL stop HDD1. So the storage node service is gone, but the updater is still running. So system CTL stop, and we will do a storage node updater. Try that again, nothing is running. So now we can do a U-mount. Unmount the hard drive. All right, it's gone. All right, hard drive has been moved over. So LL slash dev SD star SDA1. So there we go. So now we should be able to do a mount dash A. Uh, all right, mkdir mt hdd1. Uh, we need to do a system CTL daemon reload apparently. Hard drive is mounted. We need to do a ch own storage hdd1. So it's got write permissions. We should be able to go in there and it should have had the same permissions from the previous server. And you can see I've got the config, the database, the identity, and the storage blobs on this drive. Uh, at some point in the future, I may move the database directory over to the NVMe drive. Um, if I'm seeing some IO bottleneck on these drives, I don't think I am. I haven't seen any problems yet, but um, that remains something I could do down the road if I start to see IO problems as this drive fills up. So now I should be able to do a system CTL start HDD1. 
All right, it looks like it's running. All right, so now we're on the new server, 30.15. It is offline, it's misconfigured, so I need to go change the port forwards here. Uh, so we moved from 30.20 to 30.15. Let's go ahead and save that. All right, status online. Quick is misconfigured. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Uh, there was a kernel parameter here, cd etc slash sysctl dot d. That's right. All right, so there are two kernel parameters that I set up when I built this. So the first one is TCP fast open, and that allows uh, fast open from both the client and the server. Uh, by default, fast open is only enabled on the server or the client. It's only enabled on one side. Um, and setting it to three enables it on both sides. Uh, the second setting was a recommendation from the storage setup guide, and I, it is increasing the maximum buffer size to 2.5 megabytes, that's right. So I'm simply gonna copy these two over, and uh, by putting them in this folder, I put them in slash etc slash sysctl.d, and I created a new folder, storage node.conf. That's just going to allow them to get automatically loaded when the server starts up. But what I need to do now is load them for the current instance because I don't want to reboot the server. So sysctl-w, uh, and we're going to restart the storage node service. System ctl stop hdd1, system ctl start hdd1. And I usually like to keep dstat open, just shows me that something's actually going on here. Uh, so I should be able to refresh this page. And now it says quick okay. And we can use the success rate script to check the status of this, slash opt, slash storage node, bin, success rate. And we'll pass in the storage log as a parameter, home storage storage log. Since moving that drive over, I passed four audits and I've accepted 631 pieces, a 97.67% success rate. And there we go, 98%. Uh, so I'll leave this run and keep monitoring it throughout the night here and hopefully there are no issues. All right, guys, so we're going on 24 hours of uptime now without any trouble. Things are working great. We've been audited 450 times so far, and our upload acceptance rate is back to 99.7%. Also, this server is running with only 28 watts of power. It's incredible how efficient these X11 SSL motherboards and these E3 uh, V5 CPUs can be. They're great for small projects like this. That's all I have. Feel free to leave any questions or comments you guys may have. Hit that like button before you go, and thanks for watching.